it's lovely to be with everyone here tonight. Um, I suppose when uh, Lee Kung asked me before uh, uh, last year or late last year, um, I was thinking that's just an interesting topic. I wonder why she picked me, but um, and I've never found out why you selected that. Maybe because of my interest in Chinese medicine and involvement, um, or maybe it was a, as, as a role of my physiotherapy background. But anyway, so it's been a, it's lovely to be here with you all tonight, and it's been a good learning curve for me to look at some of this. Because as a, as a lecturer, I'm very much used to giving, you know, standing up and uh, giving lectures. Um, and it always requires a lot of research. Um, you know, you never go into a lecture uh, not knowing fully the topic. So, you know, I did a lot of searches on the internet, uh, found some documents and uh, different writings. Um, so I hope, hope you'll get something very useful from this as well tonight. Okay, so uh, the first issue was, I suppose, when I was first asked to talk about, um, you know, a healthy body. I wanted to get a definition of what a uh, healthy body means, and um, the first one that came to mind is the WHO definition of it. As you can see there, they define health as a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. And I suppose there's a couple of issues that have, that arose when I looked at that definition. The first is that health is a very holistic concept. So while I've been asked to talk about a healthy body, um, really health is defined as really not only just a healthy body, but also a, a, a healthy state of mind and also a good um, social well-being as well. So it's very um, holistic and that's a very common term that we've heard used increasingly over the last couple of decades. And the other issue was that it's not just about not being ill or not being sick, it's about a sense of well-being. So just because you don't have an illness, um, people can still not, not be um, defined as healthy if they haven't got, um, if they, they haven't got a, a good sense of well-being and a sense of uh, uh, feeling well. And the third thing that arose you know, when I looked at the definition was um, they used the word state. So state means that, the concept that there's, there's going to be some change associated with health. And we, we all know that um, you know, various times over our, our life, uh, sometimes you're very healthy, there's other times unfortunately when you may get very sick, um, but you're all, always oscillating within you know, um, a, 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 a state from being you know, very healthy to being very unwell. So it's constantly changing. So it raised three questions for me. Um, the first was, can you really be physically healthy without being mentally and socially healthy as well? Um, can you be physically unwell but still healthy mentally and socially? And we know that some people have, you know, life-threatening diseases or very, um, uh, um, are very unwell, um, but they still manage to maintain a sense of health because they've got either a good social network and their state of mind is, is a good uh, state. And I suppose the third question was, can you expect to stay healthy all the time? And as I said, I don't think you can. I mean, uh, with Chinese medicine, uh, people come in and they say, I'm well, but once you start inquiring, you, you find out there's always something that is bothering a person in some sense. Okay. So, um, I just hope I've got the right slide there. Let me just check on that one. Okay. Yep. Okay, so as we all know from a Buddhist perspective, um, the, concept, the, the birth, ageing and illness and death have always been unavoidable. Um, we all know the story of Prince Siddhartha. Um, he was kept cocooned in his, um, in his, his uh, uh, castle and, and area. And when he ventured out, uh, we know that he saw you know, someone dead, someone very old and someone sick. And at that time, he realised that the realities of life and of course set upon the path to find out um, how he could uh, deal with those. Um, and the issue is, I suppose, that a healthy body does also allow you some, um, uh, some scope uh, for practicing the Dharma. If, you, if you're unwell physically, um, you can be impaired in that. So that's why another reason um, to maintain. And we know that uh, also he found that out as well when he uh, practiced asceticism. Um, he starved, you know, he kind of wasted away, and it wasn't, he realised at that point in time that um, having an unhealthy body didn't allow him the opportunity to fully explore um, the realities of becoming enlightened. 
indictment. Um, when I was researching this issue too, I came across a very interesting um, text written by um, Venerable Master Sin Yun. Um, so I've extracted part of it here because it does kind of also uh, highlight some of the issues um, with uh, health being not only just physically important but also in other, other areas such as mental and social health. So, um, it's, it's a, a, a piece of, uh, I wouldn't call it a poem, but a piece of text that asks why people suffer from disease from a Buddhist perspective. And it's broken up into the three sections there. The first section, as you can read, cannot settle into a peace of mind, can't con uh, control anger, can't resolve hatred, can't calm a fearful heart or dissolve sadness or worry. And to me that gave, uh, reflected that um, health was about the emotional Um, the second uh, paragraph says, can't cease arguing, can't stop competing, practice humility and offer uh, tolerance to others, can't recognise when quiet quietitude is appropriate or maintain a healthy balance of chi. That also tended to, re to reflect to me that it was about the social health as well, that you couldn't get on with your uh, colleagues or, um, or friends. And the third says, can't endure life's difficulty, uh, lead it, can't lead a simple lifestyle, can't prop the proper practice uh, etiquette, uh, can't cease their fear of death or reorient erroneous perceptions. And again, that related to me as being about lifestyle and habits, because as you'll see, um, a lot of keeping healthy is about having healthy lifestyle and habits. Uh, and as I said before, the mind and the body are interdependent. Um, we know now, um, you know, 300 years ago with the um, Newtonian concept of the body, the body was seen like a machine and the mind was seen as being separate, separate from the body. Um, they thought it was in, kept in the pineal gland. Uh, but now we know through um, scientific research that the mind and body are, are interrelated and that um, the health of the, the body does also depend on the health of the mind and vice versa. And as I said before, um, if we use a healthy body as a tool, we can come cultivate um, the Buddhist, uh, Buddhist aspects of having a compassionate mind and uh, a compassionate heart and a clear mind. Uh, as I said, probably in the last 50 years they've started to explore this concept of uh, mind-body interaction. And um, they've also started to look at the role that uh, religion can have in maintaining um, uh, a healthy uh, aspect and, and um, uh, approach to stopping disease. And we also know that in the sutras, um, there are many uh, analogies to describing the Buddha as a doctor and the knowledge of the Dharma as a medicine, the monastics as um, nursing staff and all the lay people as patients. So there is a strong, um, a strong uh, body of knowledge also in the sutras and we'll look at that in a little bit of uh, detail later on about how uh, Buddhism was actually seen as, a, as medicine as well. And more recently we've seen that coming to, um, to the forefront of um, in the West with the, what's called the Mind Life Institute. Does anyone know of that or seen that before? Okay, so um, it started uh, probably a decade and a half ago um, where uh, the Dalai Lama started to hold interaction with many of the leading scientists in America. And every year they hold a, uh, a big large forum where they get leaders in, in scientific fields such as neurology and neuroscience, um, ecology and so on. And they explore an issue and explore their relationships between Buddhism and the, the cutting edge of science. So it's a really, um, it's a really um, fantastic opportunity uh, to explore those issues. And several books and several DVDs have evolved out of there. But in the East, um, religion is always, and I'm, I know I'm talking to a large, a large number of people who have a background um, from the East, um, that the field of health and uh, medicine have always been associated with um, Eastern religion as well. Um, in China, of course, Taoism, um, Confucianism, but also increasingly uh, Buddhism was uh, integrated into many of the theories of medicine, and we're looking at those in a little bit of detail. Um, so as you know, uh, Buddhism travelled in, into China through the, uh, through the Silk Road and uh, many aspects of Buddhism were integrated in, especially during the Tang Dynasty. Um, there's a very famous uh, Chinese medicine doctor, uh, Sun Si Mao, 
who use a lot of Buddhist concepts and uh, introduced them into mainland, into the uh, mainstream Chinese medicine at the time. And um, as I said, uh, the Buddha's realization of, of rebirth and the different stages that we go through from birth, aging, and eventually illness and death enabled him to um, to give some guidance to people as they um, as they went through those cycles. And uh, he also pointed out that a lot of disease came from um, um, looking at specific issues associated with um, the state of mind and state of uh, state of being. And that I've probably I've got more uh, surety with, which is looking at some of these concepts that when they were translated into um, Chinese medicine, um, allow a Chinese medicine practitioner to um, to deal with some of these issues. According to traditional Chinese medical theories, um, diseases are caused both internally and uh, externally. And the in these internal elements we often associate with uh, emotions, the uh, extreme emotions such as uh, excessive joy or happiness, anger, anxiety, uh, brooding or pensiveness, sadness, fear and shock were all seen to induce certain types of diseases in um, associated with that was also the cause of disease coming from outside the body. Uh, the traditional Chinese medical doctors believe that cold, wind, summer heat, dryness, damp could all invade from outside of the body and go in, inside the body and lodge within the joints and the, the channels of the king lower within the body. So, um, as well as these emotions uh, affecting the body, they also affect very specific organs in the body. So you can see here that um, if someone is excessively uh, joyful uh, or happy, it can actually affect the heart and damage the heart. Um, anger is said to affect the liver and harm the liver. Um, grief is, is, uh, affects the lungs. Um, pensiveness or anxiety affects the spleen. And shock and fear are also said to affect the, uh, the kidneys. So sometimes when people come into the clinic, um, we often ask them, when did this disease occur? And it's very common these days for people to say, oh, when I was stressed or when I was unhappy, um, these symptoms started to appear. So you can see that these ideas that the, Ch the ancient Chinese uh, put forward as a cause of disease actually you know, uh, translate empirically to what many people say, even in the modern, uh, modern times. And um, according to Chinese medicine, your, your emotions uh, should always be very balanced. So if these emotions got out of hand in any way, they were seen to engender um, disease and affect one's physical health. But Buddhists also developed a similar kind of uh, idea. Um, they referred to these as the three poisons, and those poisons were uh, greed, anger, and ignorance. And greed, as it says there, is defined as an improper and excessive desire for something. Um, so the example they give there is that, um, you know, if you, if, you, uh, if you are very hungry and you overeat, um, that can lead to an overly full stomach, um, the food doesn't digest well, and uh, can lead to other types of conditions as well. Um, so, you know, the idea is you always try and maintain a bit of weight, and the Buddha did say that. Um, the Chinese medicine also says something similar, nothing should be taken to extreme. Not too much and not too little of everything. Um, anger is also seen as a cause of disease, as it says there. Anger is the most toxic emotion compared to the two other poisons. It, its harm far exceeds all other afflictions as well. Of the 98 torments, anger is the hardest one to subdue. Amongst all psychological problems, anger is the most difficult to cure. And I think most of us would agree. You know, we all get angry at certain times of our life. I know I do. Um, and it's very difficult to uh, contain and constrain. And one of the ways I've used in the last, in the several last years, is to actually try and focus on my body when I'm feeling anger, and look to see where it's where it's uh, it's somatically reflecting in my body. I find a lot of the time it's in my throat. I feel like I feel there's some type of tightness and constriction there. And if I try and focus on that, I can actually kind of subdue the anger, and a sense of um, you know rationality reappears. And the third cause in Buddhist uh, terms was ignorance, um, and that is when one is ignorant, one is unable to understand or see things as they really are, and many of us are like this when it comes to illness. Sometimes we don't perceive what's been underlying a lot of our illnesses, and as I said, people come in and they say, you know, um, 
um, once you inquire into their illness, you can find there's sometimes an underlying emotional um, cause, in a sense, that uh, is uh, lying at the root of their illness. And some people aren't willing to see that as well. The Medicine Buddha. Um, in the sutras, um, we often uh, see analogies where the uh, Buddha is described as a doctor, as I said, the Dharma as medicine. Um, and it, particularly in the Mahayana uh, tradition, um, in Japan, China and Vietnam and Tibet, the, the medicine Buddha uh, plays a special role. And uh, interesting today, I was down uh, bike riding today with my wife and we opened the paper and we saw that there's a big exhibition starting at the New South Wales Art Gallery on the medicine Buddha. So if you get the opportunity, please go down and have a look there um, because it's based on um, one of the caves in Dunhuang, I think the uh, thousand uh, Buddha cave um, and they've actually got a special feature there on the medicine Buddha. So um, he, he specialised in curing diseases um, and uh, he, he said as you can see there that the delusion was the root cause and the medicine Buddha was seen as the Buddha of wisdom. And you can actually get the, the sutra of the medicine Buddha on the, um, on the internet as well. You can see him here uh, seated um, in the robes of a, a Buddhist monk. He's said to hold, as you can see in his left hand, a, um, a coloured jar of medicine, and in his right hand holding the stem of an Aruna fruit um, between his thumb and forefinger. And I looked, up, I looked up on the web earlier today what the Aruna fruit was, and it was related to the Hindu tradition that these, um, these uh, fruits, which used to drop from the tree, um, were seen as being very curative. Um, he was a, a Bodhisattva, who became enlightened and made 12 vows um, and they, he was termed the Buddha of the Eastern Pure Land um, and often termed the Pure Lapis Lazuli which is a, a stone that looks very blue hence why he's coloured blue. Um, and as it says there, sometimes in some of the Chinese depictions he's uh, pictured holding a pagoda uh, signifying the 10,000 Buddhas practical out of this as well, not just the historical and theoretical aspects. And I'm going to uh, give you a quick uh, review of three books that I've found very helpful in trying to guide um, the general tenets of uh, physical well-being. The first is a book by um, a Professor Agus, uh, came out in 2014, A Short Guide to a Long Life, and he was the uh, oncologist that looked after, um, uh, what was the fellow that founded Apple that passed away? Steve Jobs, yeah, so he was his physician. And uh, he wrote a very interesting book just prior to this book um, called The Elder, End of Illness, and he looked at all the, the scientific uh, research associated with longevity and maintaining health. Um, and it was a little bit technical, but about a year after that, he came out with a very handy book um, called The Short Guide to a Long Life. And I brought it here, so if anyone wants to have a look after the speech, please come up and have a look. But it's, um, it's a series of very short paragraphs um, where he outlines what he perceives as the important things to maintain health. So I've just introduced a couple of them here, just out of interest. Um, obviously, you know, some of them make sense, others aren't so, um, so clear. Um, but smile and be positive, because we all know that um, having a positive outlook on life, um, there is evidence to suggest that um, you do live a healthier life. I don't know whether you live longer, but you do generally live a healthier life, you have less illnesses. He also said eat the real food, avoid juicing, um, which is a bit counter to what a lot of people are juicing, uh, doing these days with juicing all their fruits. Um, but uh, he argues that as soon as you break down the, uh, the structure of the fruit, it, uh, it, can, um, it can lead to, um, uh, what's the word, um, a, a spoiling of many of the um, essential functions of the fruit. So, because it's exposed to the light during the process. Um, so he, he always advocates that you should eat the real thing rather than just juice of that as a, a fluid. So wear comfortable shoes, that's an interesting one, isn't it? Okay, so why he said that was because um, if, you, if you wear tight fitting shoes, and we've probably all done that at one point in that time, you actually can set up some type of inflammation. And inflammation is a cause of many of the modern diseases that we know of as well. So we actually suggest that you, know, you should wear comfortable clothes, including very comfortable. You should avoid sunburns. I think all, sun, all uh, Australians know that. Uh, when I was a young boy, we went out and light in the sun, no sunscreen. We got red, we peeled.
peel off two or three layers and we went back a month later and did the same thing. Uh, luckily we know better than that now. Um, we all go out wearing our, our uh, sunsuits and our hats and the cream and everything. Um, so we know of course that many exposure to excessive sunlight, we all need a little bit of sunlight for vitamin D, but excessive sunlight can um, you know, have dire consequences. Um, get your annual flu shot, even if you're never sick. Uh, I've, I've been getting one for the last two years. Um, and I've heard there's another doozy on the way, so it's a good recommendation for everyone. Increase your heart rate up to 50% for at least 15 minutes a day. We probably all find that difficult at times, depending on how busy your life is. But again, we know that regular exercise is very helpful, especially short periods as well, as very helpful maintaining good cardiovascular health. And he said, start a sensible caffeine diet. Um, caffeine in moderation does have positive benefits. Um, but you should cut back after 2 p.m. so it doesn't interfere with your sleep. Um, I, I used to, uh, I drink probably two or three cups a day. Um, sometimes I do have one late at night. Uh, it hasn't seemed to affect me, but uh, about two months ago I went on a detox diet for 10 days, and part of that was not having coffee. And uh, of course, the second day I started to get headaches, and I never get headaches. Um, and it did pass after the third day, it was gone. Um, but you know, it, it can be a, a habit. So now I'm back to probably one to two cups a day at the most. He said it's by a pooch, dog actually, dog lovers actually live longer, and that's true. Okay, um, not only because you have some a, a, a companion with you, but also you're likely to you have to walk the dog. And I know my wife, we had a dog up till about a year ago. It was a very um, a good way for her to go on a walk, a kilometre walk every uh, day. And obviously, we keep her fairly fit. And now she doesn't do it. She's continually saying, oh, let's go for a walk. But we don't really have the, the desire to do so with our dog. Um, measure yourself. So he said the first thing you need to do is ensure that, you know, what you, what you weigh, uh, other types of things, your, your heart rate, your blood pressure and so on. So being healthy means ensuring that you keep a measure of all those uh, health uh, factors. Eat at least five serves of veg and fruit a day. Makes common sense. Uh, does become difficult at times. Um, also, get off your backside and stretch more. As a physiotherapist, it's very important to maintain stretch. Um, and uh, up till six months ago, I was stretching, not regularly, but at least once or twice a week, and it did have a lot of good benefits. And we all know those shots you see on the internet of, you know, 90-year-olds with their leg up in the air like that. Um, so they should be admired for being able to do that. And finally, cultivate on in the office. Um, Working in a, an environment at a university, you know, I think whenever you're working with people, it's very difficult to manage. Um, so, you know, ensuring that you've got good collegial relationships be, between everyone, ensuring that you're fairly stable and emotionally in responses in dealing with issues is very important um, for maintaining health. Okay, the third 2009, this book actually preceded the one that I just told you about. He read Food, uh, food Rules, um, Professor Avis, and decided to write his own book. But this was the original, and this is by a fellow called Michael Pollan. And basically, uh, he looked at uh, the common sense rules of food, because eating, obviously, is very important for uh, maintaining health. So again, he's got these 64 little sections, so we'll go through a few of those. Avoid food products that contain ingredients that a third, guard, a third grader can't pronounce. And of course, increasingly, as you look at food these days, you can't understand you know, a quarter of the ingredients in there. So if you've got one of those pre-packaged type foods, he's suggesting you don't buy it. If it's, it's not food, if it arrives through the window of your car. <laughs> so if you're a Big Mac fan, as you'll see on the last point there, um, you definitely shouldn't be eating. Don't ingest foods made in places where everyone is required to wear a surgical hat. Okay? By that he means like a food factory. I actually worked in uh, Coleman Foods when I was a young man. We all had to wear caps and we made the, uh, the um, um, top plum puddings at the time. And of course, when they, you know, we have to add the ingredients and a lot of them were artificial back then, even 30 years ago. He said, if it, if it's, if it came from a plant, eat it. If it was made in a plant, don't. <laughs> okay? And finally, it's not food if it's called by the same name in every language. So I think Big Mac, uh, Cheetos or Pringles. Um, you know, it's still a standard where you find Big Macs on these days. Um, so he also said, what kind of food should I eat? And he argues that it should mostly be 
plan. So again, <laughs> don't eat breakfast cereals that change the colour of milk. <laughs> eat all the junk food you want as long as you cook it yourself. And eat more like the French, or Japanese, or Italians, or Greeks, because we do know that certain types of traditional diets are very healthy. I'm not too sure how the Chinese diet rates there. <laughs> Start to fall out, you have difficulty hearing, 
Um, you start to get you know sore backs and sore knees. These are also all associated with the decline of gin in the body. Qi is uh, sometimes translated as energy. Um, it's probably not a good translation actually, but it was one of the translations that was done in the 1930s when um, the French uh, went over to explore the medicines of China. And um, it's some type of uh, substance that um, uh, allows us to, um, to move and to function within the body. It has a defensive function. For example, people that may be weak in uh, qi may get more colds. Um, if they've got some uh, uh, decrease in some bodily function, that could also be due to a qi deficiency. So it's to do with function within the body. And the last one is Shen. Um, Shen, again, we, we try not to translate it, but if, if people do attempt to translate it, um, some people translate it as consciousness or mind. And it's seen as the most rarefied of all of the three, the three substances. So uh, uh, Jing is very concentrated and very dense. Qi is becoming less uh, dense and less concentrated. And Shen is very um, light and airy and uh, uh, very formless in a way. So, um, part of uh, Yang Chen involves food. Food is very important. Um, uh, uh, you're probably well aware that uh, herbal medicine is more concentrated or more, um, uh, more valuable type of food. Um, and herbs were boiled up as soups originally, so they were seen as, as a very concentrated form of um, food. So even back then, China, the Chinese physicians and the ancient doctors had a very important uh, perspective on the, the value of food as being very important to the body and for, for health reasons. So you can see here a couple of uh, quotes that I've just extracted. The five grains of the natural substances to nurture life. Food and drink are the basis of living and food is a necessary resource which forms the basis of health. Obviously I saw if people didn't eat the right type of food, they didn't eat enough type of food, they ate too much food, had food at the wrong time, certain illnesses would arise. So uh, food is seen as a very, um, as a form of therapy in a way. Um, it's based on flavour, the certain type of flavours, as you can see there. Bitter, sweet, pungent, salty and sour, all was, were seen to enter into certain organs within the body. For example, the, uh, bitter went to the heart, um, sweet went to the uh, stomach and spleen, pungent to the lungs, salty to the kidneys and sour to the liver. So certain types of flavours were attributed to certain organs within the body. Um, also grains and, and vegetables were also given some type of relationship to the organs. And the nature of the food, whether it was hot, warm, neutral, cold or cool, also were uh, used to treat certain diseases. For example, a hot disease you would try and give um, cold types of food. So the way to eat food was important too. Um, they said you should chew carefully, um, that you shouldn't favour a certain food, that you should eat broadly of all the different uh, types of flavours. And um, at certain types of uh, the year, you should try and focus on um, different types of food. For example, summertime, you should eat more cool food like um, uh, watermelon and fruits. Um, and that you also should obtain from oily and fried type of food too, um, because they can be quite uh, damaging to the digestive system. Another important concept of, Dao, uh, of uh, Yang Shen was Dao Yin, stretching. So again, they were even looking at um, the benefits of stretching, you know, 2,000 years ago. Um, so uh, this is from the uh, Ma Wan Dui tomb, showing the different types of activities that could be undertaken. And my wife uh, learned them last year. She went to Wudan Mountain and she got taught the Ma Wan Dui stretching forms. Um, and she, you know, uh, as a physiotherapist too, we know that stretching is very important for maintaining joint flexibility and uh, muscle health. Tai Chi also is very important, it tends to be more, um, uh, you know, moving the body. Um, as I said, we just finished a trial, we're just publishing a paper at the moment, we did a trial of Tai Chi versus exercise. So some of the people got allocated to the Tai Chi group randomly, others got allocated to an exercise group, so they wouldn't be paid for them to, to go to the gym. And we looked at stress, so we used a couple of self-report forms, and we found that the people that went to the, uh, that uh, undertook the Tai Chi training, uh, reduced their stress significantly more than those that did just exercise. So that was very defining for us. Um, so this is again a quote I've got from, um, uh, from the 
kind of uh, identifies the essential aspects of Young Chen. Stroking his beard, the first man replied, I've never touched liquor in all my life. I walk a hundred steps after each meal. The second grey beard joined with a smile. Nodding in agreement, the third chimed in. I eat only vegetables and the simplest fare. I travel by foot instead of by wheel, said the fourth leg of his cane. The fifth added, flourishing the sleeves of his, of his robe. I do my laundry and all other chores with my own hands. Demonstrating a Tai Chi form, the sixth explained, I do fitness exercise every day. Rubbing his nose, the seventh observed, keep the windows open and let the fresh air in. The eighth rosy cheek remarked, I get a tan from the summer sun. Twisting his moustache, the ninth stressed, early to bed and early to rise. The last gentleman concluded, raising his eyebrows, I'm as merry as the day is long. So you can see here, uh, all those things that we talked about that the, they're just finding out in the last decade or two associated with wellbeing have been well known in the Chinese uh, medical uh, literature. So I just wanted to finish off looking at um, four specific aspects of uh, the Buddhist perspective on health, vegetarianism, uh, alcohol abstention, meditation and state of mind. So I wanted to look at the current state of evidence as I undertake the training rule to abstain from fermented and distills intoxicants, which are the basis for heedlessness. Um, so we know that um, alcohol consumption is, is at odds with the uh, Buddhist quest to develop the mind. We know that when you have alcohol, your perception of the world changes. Um, and people that drink alcohol are very often um, attached to the feelings they experience. That's why they repeatedly know they can drink. And many people also use alcohol as a way of avoiding uh, confronting many of the problems they have. So Buddhism obviously does uh, offer a different way in the use of alcohol to deal with many of the, the suffering with, with the, that we're associated with, um, with on a daily basis. The second thing is about vegetarianism. I wanted to look at some of the research associated with it. Um, and it appears that there's fairly strong evidence for an association between vegetarianism and uh, cardiovascular disease. Um, so they say that, um, you know, uh, while it's not causative, there doesn't appear to be evidence that suggests it's causative, there is a good relationship. So there is something there. Um, they also know that uh, there's an association between a vegetarian diet and having lower rates of diabetes. And also that some, uh, one specific cancer actually, colorectal cancer, has also been shown to have a good association with vegetarianism. But the, uh, the evidence for a lot of the other cancers is mixed. So in general, as it says there, um, a vegetarian diet protects against, protect, protects against cardiovascular disease, particularly heart disease, and there may be some health benefits related to diabetes and colon cancer. Unfortunately, evidence is lacking, but as, as we start to produce more evidence, I'm sure we'll find that um, vegetarian has lots of uh, more benefits for, um, for health. Meditation, um, as it says there, um, they've invested many, many different um, um, conditions for the use of meditation. Um, there's a fellow called Richie Davidson who does a lot of research into uh, mindfulness meditation in the States. And uh, some of the research that's come out is that um, meditation can reduce your blood pressure um, and it may also be helpful for conditions such as irritable bowel and ulcerative colitis as well. It appears to ease many of the symptoms associated with anxiety, depression and can help people with insomnia and um, meditation can also lower the incidence, duration and severity of uh, acute respiratory illnesses as well. State of mind, um, as I said, they, they do know that people that have a religion are more likely to be associated with um, uh, better states of happiness. And it says there, if you're religious, you're less likely to be depressed, anxious and suicidal than non-religious people. Chances are also you tend to cope better with life, life crises such as illness and, bere and bereavement. And of course, um, you know, you can use your dharma to heal your mind as well. Um, and a path, of, you know, a good path of, of health can open up. Um, through using the Dharma and meditation and uh, many of the, um, the beliefs of Buddhism. Okay, so that's concluded my part of it.